welcome you to episode three of Mindset Lab, where today we have a conversation about performance blocks and the root of abuse in sport. As producer of the documentary Athlete A, and with lived experience as a seven-time member of the U.S. national gymnastics team, Jennifer Say is at the forefront of representing hundreds of elite athletes and incredibly brave individuals who demanded and continue to demand essential change within USA Gymnastics. Thank you for joining us today, Jennifer. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. I think it's super topical for you to be here today, especially with having uh, Dr. Jennifer Fraser's work kind of go hand in hand with, with Athlete A, and that's researching the effect of athlete abuse on the brain. Honestly, Dr. Fraser, we, we kind of spoke about how important today's episode is, but how, how are you doing? I'm doing great, and I'm so thankful to have Jennifer here. I I know personally how difficult it is to speak up, and it's it's a very rare individual who can sort of come out and speak the truth and just suffer the repercussions of it. And I'm looking forward to hearing you talk, Jennifer, about, I mean, you came out in 2009 with your book, Chopped Up. So I'd love to start there and just ask you some questions around what was the catalyst for writing and and did it help you with some of your trauma? Yeah, it actually came out in 2008. So one year even before that. And I um, I mean, the thought process, because at the time it, it, came out I mean I was I guess I was close to 40 and you know so I'd been out of the sport for you know more than two decades and um, I just continued I'm very interested to hear about the effect of abuse on the brain because I certainly continued to suffer despite having a very normal good life you know I mean I had two children I was married although that was very challenged um, I had a really good job. I worked at Levi's, which I still do. I had a lot of friends. You know, I had functional relationships with my family members. And yet, um, you know, there were no outward signs of sort of problems. I wasn't suffering from addiction or, you know, any of the kind of myriad ways. But I really did continue to suffer and periodically suffered from depression and um, definitely um, challenges to my self-esteem. And I found myself to be sort of quite a pleaser and kind of setting myself aside in many circumstances um, to kind of please all of the other people around me and believing everything was my fault. And I also had a really, I would say, sensitive shame trigger. I felt shame very easily. Um, and so as one does, and I, you know, continue to suffer, I just, you know, I, I think some people sort of live in that and that's okay. And that becomes normalized. But for me, that wasn't like, I did, I didn't want to live that way. And I think at a certain point, the suffering gets so great that you, you decide you're going to do something about it. And I think, you know, the outpouring of young athletes now, that's what they tell me. They, they, the suffering was too great. They didn't want this to happen to somebody else. They wanted to make a change. And, you know, that was me. And so, um, you know, I was in therapy and sort of starting to understand my own trauma. I didn't really understand it at that point. And the, the, the impacts of abuse, you know, it was explained to me very succinctly by my therapist at one point who said, you know, when, I, when a, a mother hits her child or abuses her child, she says, I wouldn't have to do this if you didn't misbehave. And so the child then internalizes all of it and blames themselves for anything and goes into the world thinking everything is their fault and trying to please everyone. And so they accept a lot of mistreatment because of it. And it was like a light bulb moment for me to understand that I'd been doing that. And he said to me, you know, if you love a child, they believe they're worthy of love. And if a child suffers abuse, that's what they believe they deserve. And I was like blown away. It was like, holy shit, now I get it. It was like all these years of sort of introspection. It, it just made so much sense for me in that moment. And when I understood it, I could start to kind of tackle it. So it, he said all of those things to me actually after I'd written the book. So writing the book was kind of an attempt to explore as, as you've asked kind of what had happened and to kind of say it all. Cause there were bits and pieces of it I was so ashamed about that I didn't tell anybody you know, um, ashamed of my own behaviors, ashamed of my own weakness or what I perceived as weakness, ashamed of the self um, harm, ashamed of things that happened with my parents. Um, and I felt like if I could write that all down, it might kind of shed, put sunlight and then the shame might evaporate. Now, I also just wanted to be a writer and I, you know, that was part of it as well. And I felt that 
I'd never written anything that kind of saw the light of day. So I felt, well, I might have a shot at writing a really truthful memoir, which I saw as a coming of age story. Anyway, I also thought there was very little chance it would get published. So I don't know how courageous it was in, in reality. And I certainly, even when I knew it would get published, did not anticipate the backlash. So the courage built between 2008 and now, <laughs> um, it wasn't, you know, I wasn't totally prepared for, for, for what would happen. But in fact, I was correct that writing it all down and just putting it out there does just instantly evaporate any shame. It's like, you're not keeping a secret anymore. You're not hiding. It suddenly doesn't look or feel so bad once you just say it. Um, so that was a very long-winded answer, but you know, I so I wrote it for a variety of reasons. One, I always had an aspiration to be a writer. Two, I was sorting through some stuff, and three, I felt if it did get published, and I didn't say this yet, just connecting with one other human, one other young athlete that felt this way, it could have them feel less shame and have them suffer less. Because for, for me, reading memoirs was an obsession, and I felt that way when I felt a connection to another human. Um, that had suffered some of what I had, even in a different sort of area of life, addiction, depression, like not necessarily sport. Um, it made me, it eased my shame and it eased my sorrow. And so I, I did recognize that from the outset that it could be helpful to somebody else. It's interesting you say that because I work a lot with abused athletes and they will speak up and they will report to police, in fact, which is a very difficult thing to do. It can be extremely painful, very, very frightening. Um, you're, you're so worried that everyone's going to attack you for doing it, for speaking truth to power, as we all know. Um, but they do it because they want to protect other athletes. They do yeah. it because they want to protect other abuse victims. And I, yeah. I, I really relate to that in terms of your writing. And, and in a sense, you've created a movement. I'm on, by having the courage, you might not see it that way, but one of the strongest ways to extinguish shame is to speak up, is to say, what I have to say is valuable. What I have to say is meaningful. It, yeah. it creates community because as we know, shame is designed to exclude you and That's make right. you think that you don't belong. Yes, it's a very good point. It's a, it's a way of asserting that this happened. I am a reliable narrator. I won't be told that this did not happen, that this is only my truth, but not the truth. I won't be shamed into believing it was my own weakness that caused this. It's an assertion of all those things. To say I am, you know, to put into the world that your story matters and that you are a reliable narrator is whether you do it in a book, whether you post your story on social media or whether you just tell your friends and your parents, it, it has the same effect, I think. And, and for me, I needed to kind of sort through things personally and do it this way. And, you know, I'm not sort of downplaying the courage because I certainly think that over the years I've become more courageous. I just going in, I didn't sort of one, anticipate necessarily that it would get published. <laughs> Two, I didn't anticipate the backlash and the need to withstand that and be so strong. And I, I will say though, that strengthened my resolve because with every sort of criticism, with every, you know, allegation that I was a liar and only in it for money and I was such a loser and that's why I was so bitter and angry. I was like, yeah, okay, <laughs> there's really something wrong here. So in a sense, the harder they pushed back and the more they insulted me, the stronger I became and the more sort of courageous. and. And I would say things like, this isn't an indictment, it was just my experience. And that's, that's, that's not exactly true. I mean, it is just my experience. I didn't, it wasn't a journalistic account, account. I wasn't reporting broadly on the environment in every gym across the country, but it was an experience that was illustrative of the common experience across the country. And so it was in fact an indictment. I said that not as a lie, but as a way to sort of manage some degree of self-protection because it was so difficult already. But over time, I became more confident, <laughs> you know. I'm seeing the, like, even just watching the documentary, it's it's like the institution that was really meant to protect the athletes who are being strong every day through, like you athletes really. Um, we kind of talked about with Dr. Willinga, uh, Dr. Jennifer Willinga, who joined us last, last episode or a couple episodes ago. Um, about like one in 30 people are psychopaths and and genuinely there are people who will 
not be kind of like actually listening to what is genuinely being shared. And I think of the strength it took to even mention here and there uh, for every athlete that was experiencing this kind of abuse and for all those times that it wasn't listened to. Um, and I think of like young athletes in particular. And I'm curious when you look now at young athletes and you're, you're continuing to learn about young athletes experience and your experience as a young athlete, um, how do you educate young women and how do you protect young women and young athletes? Yeah, I mean, I think, and I, I did always say this even back in the beginning when the book first came out, the conditions in gymnastics are unique in a sense and that the athletes are so young. Um, and so, you know, I think there is abuse across the variety of sports. I think they're intensified and exacerbated potentially in the sport for a variety of reasons. When I think when an in individual sport it can be worse, it's sort of a more intense relationship with the coach and you spend more time alone with the coach. Um, gymnastics, the athletes are very young. They've created this condition, whether or not it's valid, where you have this narrow window of opportunity to succeed. And so that forces kids to train on injuries and go back too soon because the emotional and physical abuse set the sexual abuse aside is incredibly rampant and I would argue that you know forcing a young athlete to train on broken bones is abuse and I, I did that for several years and and certainly suffer the repercussions of that today um, you know so the individual sport the age the obsession and the focus on weight um, it's also a sport that there is a lot of touching there's spotting and and that creates blurred lines um, you know, around what is appropriate and what isn't. And then there's just the standard, standard operating procedure, which is sort of from the dark ages, which is, you know, to build an athlete, you need to break this athlete. And I think other sports have evolved a bit beyond that. I think to some extent, even in professional sports, you have coaches who are much more, you know, modern in their sensibilities about letting an athlete heal before they go back out on the floor. Now, honestly, financials might be driving that, right? If you've invested millions and millions of dollars and you have a long-term contract, the last thing you want is to take that athlete and you have to pay them on the contract regardless. You know, the last thing you're going to do, I think, is push them to injury that is unrecoverable. Um, because that's a sunk cost then. And so, you know, I've observed in basketball, for instance, you know, a, a much greater willingness to let athletes heal and do the proper physical therapy. And I mean, that was just not how it's done. So, you know, in the sport of gymnastics, the standard operating procedure is basically coaching cruelty. There are exceptions, but that's the standard. And that is what most of the high profile coaches do, not all of them, but, but I would argue most. And so for even those coaches who aren't psychopaths, as you put it, um, you're inculcated into that way of thinking. And so that becomes normalized. And in fact, you're celebrated for it. And if you don't do it, and many coaches I've talked to who would say, it's this, it's like hazing or, or some crazy thing like that. Like, it's like, you have to behave this way or you're not respected. And they, while maybe not psychopaths, I think, you know, you said it, Jennifer, that most people will start behaving like those around them. It takes an incredible amount of moral clarity and courage to stand up for what is right, no matter what. And so within this coaching culture, most won't. They may not be as cruel as some, but they'll be passive about it and they'll allow the cruelty in their presence. So, you know, what do we do? How do we raise our children? Well, you know, this is a sport where obedience is just pounded into you. I don't want obedient children. I want disobedient children. I want good trouble. You know, I want them to have a sense of, you know, being able to always ask questions and always challenge and always say, you know what, I'm not comfortable with that. Don't talk to me that way. Don't do that to walk out to call me immediately. You know, at nine years old, I was in the gym you know, maybe 40 hours a week, you know, that coach had a lot of influence. And, and my young coach, the coaches I had when I were young, were a positive influence. These coaches need to be thinking about how they raise a child to be a strong adult, um, to know what they want, to challenge authority, <laughs> to know on their own terms what they want, you know, to ask this child questions. How do you feel today? How does your body feel? What do you want to do today? No one asked me questions. They just drove me. Um, and so the result of that is, you know, you believe it's better to be silent. If you speak up and say anything, you'll be criticized as weak. The other result is you grow up and you don't know what you want as an, a grown young adult. You have no idea. No one's ever asked you what you wanted before. What a crazy way to go into the world, <laughs> you know? 
And so I just, I think we have to ask our children questions. We have to teach them to use their voice. We have to help them figure out what they want in life and in the world um, and not just beat into them what we want for them. That's our job as parents, right? Is to help our child kind of find the things they love and they're good at and be able to go into the world as strong adults. And I think coaches have a similar role. And so if coaches reorient their mindset instead of this very name of, how do I make this person into the best athlete I can? Then, you know, that clears it up, but that's not what we do. The other issue with viewing it only through the lens of how do I turn this, this kid into a champion is you ignore the ones that may not be. And the whole point of sport is that equips any child to go into the world with self-esteem and with an ability to kind of learn from their mistakes and to persevere. Like we want all children to learn these things, to be a good teammate, to treat teammates with love and empathy, all these things. If you're only giving attention to the ones you think can be champions, I mean, what's the point of that? (laughs) So, you know, you want you want a child to come out of sport with stronger self-esteem, a stronger sense of what they can contribute to the world. And if that's not what's happening, then we're failing is, is, I don't know how else to put it. (laughs) Yeah. There's every single thing that you've just said, you said earlier, you're interested in the research. Every single thing you just said in terms of a research point of view is so fascinating because so when I was listening to you, in the film Athlete A, you talked about being an obedient child. Well, for me as a researcher, that just sent all my alarm bells off because in the 1960s and 70s, Stanley Milgram at Yale University was doing research into what he calls the perils of obedience. And because we teach our children in school and at home and so on, not to be critical thinkers, not to speak up when things are wrong, and then we do very psychotic things really where we tell children, if you're being abused, you need to report. But you know, people, as soon as you do speak up, including when you're a child, you're attacked. So the reason why Milgram was uh, the Yale psychologist was studying obedience is he was looking at the Holocaust. And he was, saying, exactly. he was saying, look at these, they normalized the killing of their neighbors and their neighbors' children. And when they were in the war crimes, they all said, we were told to do it. We were following orders. And you have to teach them not to. You have to literally teach it. I had a really interesting conversation. This is, they're all very fascinating to me um, with uh, Philip Zimbardo, um, the professor from Stanford. I'm sure you know all the experiments he's done. And, you know, he, I had the, I went to Stanford. That's not where I met him. I met him um, somewhat later as an adult and he said to me, he said such an interesting thing. He was, um, he had started this program called Heroes in Waiting for children. And he said, all the cruelty I've seen people capable of in the world, everything you've just described. He said, I still believe we can teach them to do differently. And we can teach young children that when that moment arises and it may never do, it may never, but when it does, we can teach them and prepare them to be the one that speaks up and intervenes and says, this isn't right. But if they're not prepared, they will just go with the flow. As you described, we've seen it in history. How many times have we seen it? You know, and so, and these adult coaches do it. That's what I described in the beginning. Even the ones who go in with the best interests um, of the kids at heart, this behavior becomes normalized. And for their own self-protection, they say nothing. They may not abuse, but they, they let it exist. And then it has the as it goes on over time, it becomes normalized and it doesn't even appear abusive anymore. It's just the way it is. It's, it's like air, it's everywhere. You, know, you can't even see it at a certain point. And that's one of the things that I found to be so insidious for the athlete because I'm suffering. I'm in pain still. I, for, you know, in all the myriad ways you could be, whether it's, you know, depression or anxiety or a persistent eating disorder or, you know, persistent, you know, Lee, engaging in abusive relationships and all of these things, you then internalize it. And it's, it's, it's shame revisited upon you because everyone else is telling you this is normal. And how do you withstand that? You know, and then you come forward and you say it out loud and they really attack you because then it really is, it's your own greed or self-interest or you're just pathetic (laughs) and you couldn't take it. So it's your own fault. And to withstand that, is really, really difficult as, as you can imagine. And it gets easier with every person that comes forward that you can stand with. But for me, I waited a good long 12 years before I had anyone to stand with, you know? And that's why I, 
am so proud of all of these women now um, who are coming forward and standing together. And while it may seem um, like there's this unstoppable army, there's still a lot of resistance and pushback in the sport. And these young women still get really nasty um, pushback, backlash, you know, campaigns directed against them from their gyms, you know, parents dismissing, you know, coming forward. It's, it may seem sort of like nothing, but they'll drive these campaigns and get all these other kids to say, it wasn't like that. This person's lying. It's so positive. We love this coach, which why can't you just say, I didn't have that experience, but I'm really sorry that you did, but they can't. Um, and so, but at least they have each other now and they can, they can stand with each other, but it's hard. It, it does. It takes, I don't know how I had it in me. Honestly, I don't know <laughs> to this day, but I do know that the harder they fought me and the more they insulted me, the stronger I felt. Part of, part of what uh, kind of what you're saying now and, and your kind of your quote in athlete day was saying about like, you could be as cruel as you needed to be to get what you needed to out of your athlete is kind of the standard of coaching and, and how that standard of coaching across sport and more so in, in gymnastics than what seems like anywhere else at the moment is um, that this coaching philosophy was literally uh, like kind of birthed in, in during war times, whether it was the cold war or whether it was like, like, I don't know, world war two, or for example. And so what the kind of, we talked about with Dr. Walinga that I'm realizing is very relevant right now is kind of this idea that sport is war and, and people kind of uh, referring to it as combat training. And then there's, and then there's military personnel who are saying that, well, we've realized now that war is not, not anything good for the psyche. And the, the modern neuroscience research is saying that brains are, do not react well to this environment. And, and we are realizing now that we need to protect our, our military personnel the way that that kind of sport is lagging behind to do. Yeah, that's a, it's a really interesting point. I've been thinking about this a lot lately. I was actually thinking about it when I heard someone talking about, um, you know, this notion of defunding the police. Go with me on this journey for a second. Um, and I was trying to understand what does that mean? What does that look like? And he talked about the warrior mindset and it, it's beyond sport. It's in our country as it, it's the mindset, right? You go out there, you win, you beat the competition. I mean, whole sports are organized around war games, essentially. I mean, that's what football is, right? <laughs> but he, he talked about how police officers are trained with this war set and you go into a city and you dominate the citizens. That is the goal is to beat them back, keep them in submission, keep them behave. That's the mindset, whether stated or not, but that is the training and the mindset. And what if we reoriented that to a guardian mindset? You're guarding the citizens, even those who break the law, you are still a guardian of the citizens. And it was sort of a light bulb for me that this was pervasive in our culture overall. Um, and that it certainly is um, the mindset of coaches, I think beyond gymnastics, certainly um, in a sense, because the athletes are so young in gymnastics, it's that much easier, but not only is it the mindset, it's like a badge of honor, you know, how brutal can it be to get this performance out of the athlete. And it, it, I, I, I write about this a bit in the book, but like, I don't think people understand what it's like to just live in fear all the time, fear of the coaches, fear of life ending potentially injury people watch the sport they don't realize like you it's not like when you're training in track and field and if you have a bad day you have a slow time you could land on your head and you could die i know i know athletes that died i know athletes in wheelchairs i like you can literally have a life ending injury at any time and so living it is like living in wartime you know and i just found that degree of heightened anxiety and fear living in that all the time, it just became too much. Now, I do think some people sort of set it aside. I, I don't know, I couldn't, I was sort of always like intellectualized to all of it, you know, every skill, I thought about the physics of it, I knew what could happen. Um, and so for me, it was just like living in constant fear, you know, and then on top of that anxiety about weight and weigh-ins and then depression and then pain. Living in constant pain is also really wearing on the psyche. And I was living in constant pain because I was training on injuries that never healed. And you just think about what that does to a person, not even a child, a person. It's a horrific way to live. 
Um, and so it's no surprise that most of these kids are coming out with PTSD. I mean, they are, I hadn't heard it named that until recently, until someone told me a young athlete that that's what she was diagnosed with, but I completely see it and understand it and kind of recognize now looking back that it, it is probably, you know, what I was suffering from when you looked at the collection of, uh, issues. <laughs> when you, again, from a research point of view, both of what you've been saying, so James, and if we go back to this idea about war, what I found so fascinating in the athlete A story was the Carolis. And really, when you look at what they did and what they represented, they came from an incredibly oppressive, destructive, traumatizing society, so they defected. But instead of defecting and doing the guardian mindset and putting aside the abuse that they came from, they recreated an abusive environment that was their home in a new country. It's really tragic what they yeah. did. And they shaved some of the edges off. So they thought it wasn't really that bad. Like in Romania, you know, they talk in the, in the film about how Marta used to slap the girls and their rings would leave. Geza talks about it. And so they kind of, they, they shaved some of the harshest edges off and I think thought then, oh, what are you even complaining about? The thing that I think is really important and I, I don't know that everybody agrees with me but I feel very strongly about this. They didn't create it here. It was here already and they brought it and they found a home. It was, I mean, I can, you know, I started gymnastics in the mid 1970s. I, you know, know coaches that started in the late sixties. I can cite scores of examples of coaches here in America that deployed these same tactics, including my own. They even hit kids in the seventies. They sort of stopped hitting in the, in the eighties that became kind of unacceptable, but there was sexual abuse. There was emotional abuse. Um, eating disorders were rampant all the way back to the early seventies, the fat shaming and the weigh-ins. Um, there was more slapping. There was, you know, training on injuries, the shaming and belittling and degrading all the way back in America to the 70s. The Carolis brought it here and, and validated it in a sense because they were these champion coaches. But I, I, it may seem like a minor distinction, but it lets us off the hook here. It lets us off the hook. And I think there's real danger and harm in thinking one person or one coach created the system. Just like I think, and that's why it was important to me in the film, to connect Nasser to the broader culture of abuse. If we think it's just him and it's one bad apple, then we think we're fine now because he's in prison and we are not fine. We would also think we were fine because the Carolis are out of the sport and retired. The fact is these behaviors, the environment is unchanged. It's exactly the same without them here. They made their mark, they made it worse. What they really did was centralize control of gymnastics. It was very decentralized before they came. That's what they recreated here was the centralized control, which again, created more problems, more obedience. You know, you weren't going to get picked for the team if you didn't keep your mouth shut, you know, which is something the film highlights also, right, with Maggie. Um, and so that centralized experience, those training camps, which were really cruel and abusive and isolating, they brought that here and they certainly improved the program, I guess you could say. And so again, it validated these tactics, which were here all along. We just weren't, I think I say this in the film, as good at it. Um, but I, 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 it may seem like a small distinction, but I do think it's an important one because it's the whole system. It's not one coach or one gym. It's uh, everything. I, I totally agree. It reminds me of that line from Spotlight where it's the Catholic church. And so it's not high stakes and it's not winning and it's, it's none of that. There's no high stakes at all, but the same kind of abuse is occurring. Yeah. And one of the, um, I think one of the newspaper journalists says it takes a village to raise a child and it takes a village to abuse a child. Yeah. And basically he's looking at the system yes. itself and yeah. the cover up. And the fact that we have a justice system, going back to law enforcement, we have a justice system where it's acceptable for a lawyer to pay a family whose child is being abused to remain silent. The, yeah. the fact that that's legal even is unbelievable. And it's a part of why child abuse is so rampant in all of our cultures, not just America, it's everywhere. Yeah, and I, I guess I would, yes, I completely agree. And I, I think that there's always high stakes. I mean, the reputation of the Catholic church is the, are the stakes involved and the reputation of any organization more powerful than the individual. And I would say, 
even the money and medals was about the reputation of USA Gymnastics and the US Olympic, you know, the USOC. All of that just contributed to that reputation, which allowed, it's the cycle, right? If you maintain a pristine reputation, you can then get more money, more sponsorship dollars, pay leaders more. So it's all about reputation. And with the Catholic Church, obviously, it was about reputation as well. And it's about sort of the organization over these individuals that are being being harmed, you know. Um, and, you know, they would argue the greater good, which is, you know, obviously crazy but you know that if you sort of protect this system or this organization we can have more kids participate more kids win it which is is obviously kind of ridiculous and i don't think any i don't think any of this happens consciously like i don't think there's these evil people that go in but it the incentives um kind of line up ultimately to ignore abuse um and as you've said most people won't won't stand up and say this is wrong a child is being hurt they won't they'll go with the flow you have you know, and as i look at the the nasser situation um you know clearly that he's a d very disturbed individual he constructed his entire life i believe around finding children to abuse um he's he's deranged he's sick but steve penny who knew about it and looked the other way and protected him and continued to send children to the ranch where they would be abused, that's evil. That is evil. And all of the people who he had do his bidding within USAG, and we don't even know who all of them are yet, but there were many, and they did it passively, that just supports the evil. You know, there, there's tears, right? <laughs> um, and the fact that these adults in power could look the other way while children were being harmed, I'll never understand it. I just, I won't. But I, I will say this, I was never surprised by it as the story started breaking because that's what was happening at the club level every single day. In my very own club, you know, I would argue 20% of coaches on the staff at any given time were suspected pedophiles and nobody did anything. And, you know, at certain points, some of them would be sort of disappear into the night. <laughs> you know, there were, the complaints got, you know, there were too many complaints. And so they would be asked to leave, but they, the authorities weren't called, the police weren't called, Child Protective Services weren't called, and they would just go get a job at another gym, just like the Catholic Church moving priests from parish to parish. So this idea of kind of belittling the the, the the child that speaks up and then just sweeping it under the rug and moving on and protecting the reputation of the club, the organization, the coach, that that had been going on as long as I was in the sport. Well, and it's still going on. I mean, oh, I, oh God, yes. Well, it's still going on and it's not just gymnastics. Oh, no. It's everywhere in culture. It's in schools. I mean, in Canada, we have a history with residential schools where they would move these highly abusive individuals on just to the next unsuspecting school. I mean, it's it is yes. so rampant. Public schools, I, it is. It's, it's everywhere. Boy Scouts. I mean, you can't be a kid and do anything like want to learn in school or go to an outdoor education club or play a sport that you love with because your real issue is abuse. And it, Jameson, I mean, your question was now we have this knowledge so what do we do what we have to do i believe and i'd love to hear your thoughts on this jennifer what i think we have to do is educate children from the earliest age yes, I agree children that. and parents there we don't need to teach the coaches we don't need to teach the administrators they've had their chances the teachers to do the right thing and and that system isn't working not because they're bad people it's just not working but if you were taught as a yes. kindergartner hey if any adult in your world does x y and z you've got to speak up this is this is the language you need to use this is the narrative of what's happened language. proper vocabulary yes i agree with that that's yeah. the that's the only way and it's not that i think we should give up trying to get the bad coaches out or to improve leadership in these organizations but the only way it really changes is um, when the children and the parents say so. And, I, you know, let me be clear. I don't think that means that parents need to overmanage their children. They need to teach them to be in the world and speak up for themselves. And very young children can do it. I have a six-year-old son. I am, I've been very conscious of teaching him to do that, not just to speak up for himself, but for others, um, if he sees something. And I've witnessed it 
many times at the playground. Um, and I'm like, whoa, it works. <laughs> you know, this kid's six. And I gave him the words and my husband gave him the words and he know he knows how to stand up for himself. He knows how to stand up for others. Um, that's the only way. And I, I again, I don't think because I the interpretation or the misinterpreted takeaway could be, I'm going to hover over my child incessantly and make sure they never encounter any harm. And that's not effective. Unless you're going to go with your kid to college, <laughs> that's not going to work. You need to teach your child to do this in the world. And very young children can do it. Now, parents who are sending their very young children into gyms, programs, et cetera, I do advise talk to the coach, understand the coaching philosophy, you know, watch a time or two, see what you think. Don't watch every time. Kids need to have their own lives and independent lives and be with their peers. Because I, I do see an overreaction, which is parents then overmanaging their kids' lives. And I, I don't think that is a good outcome either. I think it's, um, you know, the helicopter parenting and, you know, sort of managing every aspect of your child's life. I have four children. My job is to make sure that they can go into the world and speak for themselves and, and make meaningful contributions. The more I, I am educating myself into conversation like this, the more adults are absolutely as flawed as, 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 as human beings, we're all flawed, right? Yeah. I'm learning, about my, I'm learning about that about my parents and about previous coaches and stuff like that right now. But I'm also, what's sticking out to me specifically in the context of Athlete A was it's kind of scary how adults and, and really society in general will accept the, the standard of, of cruelty. And, and it, one thing in the, in, the, in the film that stuck out to me was um, uh, Coach Caroli, um, when, they, when he had like branded himself as, as a, a natural born Texan. And it was kind of this idea that, oh, well, he's a part of the American people now. He's part of the, like, just that kind of that North American concept of, well, this is part of our culture and back to that warrior mindset. And, and it's what, what's reminding me right now is, is, or what it's reminding me of is asking questions and equipping young people to ask questions. He was, um, he was the ultimate showman, Caroli. I mean, he was P.T. Barnum of the 1980s with a Texas ranch and a 10 gallon hat and a funny accent. And the press was complicit in, in sort of accepting that image of himself um, that he created. They, celebrated they loved it he was entertainment nbc was totally complicit i've gone back and i've read i read a piece that was in the washington post recently uh, an old piece from 2000 um just chastising the young women on the 2000 olympic team as whiners and babies that wouldn't do what bella the hero wanted them to do and so there's so many layers of complicity in all of this you know the 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 press was part of it until the Indy Star came along and actually dug in. And I think it speaks to the heroes that local journalists can be when they do their job. But the heartening but also alarming thing is how many things and how many people had to do their jobs right for this to actually come to pass. You know, you had Rachel Den Hollander, who, well, you had the Indy Star, who first did a, a, a piece on um, USAG bearing cases of abuse. It wasn't even on Larry Nasser, it was on bearing 55 other cases of abuse. Rachel Den Hollander, who is the most credible witness in the world, you couldn't ask for a more credible person, which shouldn't be what's required, read that piece and came forward, was willing to use her name and likeness. Then, the detective, Andrea Monford, who was, you know, trains police officers in victim-centered questioning. You know, she wasn't the first detective to question Nasser. She was one in a long line, but she did her job. And then the prosecutor, Angie uh, Povolitis, and then the civil attorney, like every one of these people had to do their job correctly, which doesn't seem like too much to ask, but clearly it is. And there were 50 credible witnesses that had come forward in just a few weeks and still the community, the gymnastics community was decrying them as liars. 50, I mean, we had to get to a hundred before anybody was like, okay, maybe there's something here. It's just, it's kind of astonishing. And then they moved on to the, well, it's a one bad apple. We don't really have a cultural problem. And now they're just sort of stunningly silent about the whole thing in my, in my opinion. So, you know, part of being adult is admitting when you made a mistake. And one of the things we need to teach our kids to do is apologize and admit when they've made a mistake, because unless we can do that, we can't move on and repair. And we have still not gotten to the phase of USAG admitting that they've made a terrible mistake and that they have a lot of work to do.
um, they continue to push forward with PR platitudes, in my opinion. And so I just don't see, I, I'm with you, that the only path forward is to equip children to be their own heroes in waiting, because the adults in charge aren't doing it. They're just not. I think, um, again, from a research point of view, one of the arguments that I make is that, yes, we have to educate our kids, but we also need the adults across the board to learn the actual, like, to, to put to the side these myths that they operate under. Whereas there's a lot of research that shows that if you treat an individual, whether it's in marketing or it's in a sport, with respect, with nurturing, with care, with allowing them to fulfill their potential, whatever that's going to be, because 1% is going to be a champion. And just as you said, the rest are going to become amazing, strong, resilient citizens who care and who bring all of their own personal gifts out into the world. But this model, this idea that it's exactly what I study, I study the lie, and it's an absolute lie of falsehood that hurting people achieves greatness. But it is the bullying and abuse lie that dominates our society in sport, music, politics, whatever. And what's what I found so fascinating in Athlete A, I thought they really did such a powerful um, just display of it. I loved how Dr. Larry Nassar caught one of the indie star reporters. He was so full of compassion for himself, so concerned about what would happen, his reputation, his eyes filled with tears. These people are, are always victims. They don't understand the harm they do. They, whether they understand or not is irrelevant, but they are always the narcissist victim. And they're yeah. so full of self-pity that it, that all they can see is their own image in the pool of water. They don't see their victims and they never will. So many of the detectives who questioned him, there's a great podcast app from NBR, NPR, Michigan NPR called Believed. And they actually have some of the interrogations with police officers before Andrea Munford. So in all the years, cause the first person that reported him was 1997 and they have some of those transcripts. Um, they all treated him with pity. I mean, he just started to sing his sad song and they're like, yeah. And he would then blame the survivor that had come forward saying, oh, well, she was a victim of abuse. She sees everything through this lens. She over-sexualizes everything. She's a teenager. That's just crazy. And he'd whip out his PowerPoints. And I think that, I think that the really sort of pernicious thing, and I try to describe this, I think in the film is that lie that gets perpetrated about, um, abuse. I mean, first of all, we lose more than we gain. We even lose, if you just want to see it through the lens of winning and champions, we lose more than we gain um, by abusing because some people sort of either willingly opt out or they just are broken to the point where they can't continue. And I, I can't even tell you how many I know that that's the case. They were world championship team members. They should have gone on to go to the Olympics, but they just broke um, because arguably they were sane and you would break in that situation. Um, but the lie is then believed by the athletes themselves and that gets internalized and that's what creates the shame because not being able to take it is, is then that becomes your weakness because the lie that this is what's required, this is just tough coaching, it's not abuse. If that is true, then there's something wrong with me that I am suffering and that's what creates the shame and the suffering. Um, but. Of course, you know, I have a team of probably a thousand people that work for me all over the world. I've never yelled at a single person. It's sort of unthinkable to me that I could get better performance out of anyone or a more engaged team. Um, I have tough conversations. I'm direct if we need to have that hard conversation, but you always treat every single person with respect. And, you know, more often than not, if somebody's not performing, they don't want to be there. And so you have that conversation. What is it you would rather do? <laughs> Maybe this isn't the right thing. Um, you know, we try to sort of deploy this notion of the growth mindset, which I'm sure you know about, you know, Carol Dweck, and we've had her come and speak to us, but this idea that maybe you can't do it now, but you just can't do it yet. So let's keep trying. What are we going to do? And I'm very conscious of that with my own kids, but that is just not the orientation in the world of coaching and certainly not in gymnastics. And I, I just, I think that there are some that have done it this way so long. You know, my coaches have coached this way for over 50 years. They aren't going to change. You know, it's, it's, 
I'll, I'll leave you with one thought. You know, I've, I've thought about this a lot lately. When we when we think about you know a young child in school potentially learning to read, let's just say, as my son is learning now, it's kind of unthinkable that a teacher would scream at that child and berate that child and call them stupid if they were struggling to learn to read. You know, you're so stupid. I don't teach stupid children. You're not even trying. Get the hell out of here. Which is exactly what was said to us every single day in the gym. So if we don't believe that's gonna be helpful to teach a child to read, why would we believe it would be helpful in the arena of sport? And why would we believe it would be helpful for a child that was particularly talented? We're all human in the same way. We all learn in the same way. Um, and so, you know, the, the success that the US team has had, it's despite these behaviors, not because of them. I, you know, I feel strongly that it is absolutely despite them. And unfortunately, these incredibly strong women and men, athletes, they come out ill prepared to do much else because they, you know, we've just kind of broken them. You know, it's it's really unfortunate. So I, yeah, I agree with everything you said, of course. One of the things you said at the very beginning shows the lie, which is that if in fact it was true that berating and shaming and hurting and using cruelty was successful, it would be rampant in professional sports and you don't see it, not one not tiny more. bit. It used to be much more common, I think, but I think thoughtful people know it doesn't work. And again, it might've happened in professional sports to protect their, their investment. I don't care why it happened, but at least they've moved most. I think there are still some, but um, many have moved beyond it. And you see many thoughtful coaches like Steve Kerr, you know, the Warriors coach here in the Bay Area, incredibly bright, smart, I think very up to date on how do you elicit strong performance? How do you create a strong sense of team? All of that. Well, and Jameson, isn't the Raptors coach really well known and super successful in Toronto? Because one of the specific things he does is protect athletes against injury in the first place. He has yeah. a whole system that's very scientific. Yeah. Is that true, Jameson? Am I getting that right? Yeah. yeah, Nick Nurse, Coach Nick Nurse, he's he's very well known for that, and that's kind of why he's he's kind of not idolized, but he's respected for yeah. for the work that he does with uh, the Raptors and the national team as well with the Canadian national team because he's holding these athletes responsible that they know their bodies best, and uh, I mean they contributed or that contributed to a championship. I mean, it speaks but to that. Jennifer, having you on the show, I know your time is at a real premium. You're a very sought after businesswoman along with being an amazing leader, really, in advocacy in the athlete world and sport world and, and just child safety world. So your words are very cherished by so many, but we really appreciate um, all your sharing today and your just your clarity and authenticity. I mean, when I was talking about courage before, I just want to say that what I, what I really admire about you back in the day when you wrote your book was that you could see it for what it was, when you have a world around you that tells you that what you see is fine, it's normal and it's okay. And you still say, no, I will write down what I see to be true and I will trust that. There's something very powerful in that. It's what you're teaching your son and your other kids. I, I think it's very hard. Most athletes stay in this world. It's a very small world. Most of the athletes come out and they coach or they judge or they, you know, I had the benefit of having stepped very far outside of the world. Many feel like a big fish in a small pond and they want to maintain acceptance in that world. And, you know, I will say that was difficult, even though I wasn't that involved in the sport. Those were my people. That was my community. I grew up knowing nothing else. And so it was very hard to be rejected uh, by that world. But but I had most of my support system outside of it, you know, and I certainly wasn't dependent on the sport for work, um, for money, for my esteem, for any of it, you know, and so I, I had that that ability to step outside and beyond it is very difficult. And I think for these young women who are still in it, there are many young women who are still training, who've come forward to tell their stories. I have the utmost respect because to be able to see it when you're mired in it, I can't even imagine, but it's what, I, I think it's one of the reasons Athlete Day has resonated and they could have conversations with people who are outside of it, which lends perspective as well. So much of the media around this sport up until now the only people watching or paying attention are people that are connected or engaged in the sport. So it didn't kind of broaden the purview in any way. It didn't let that sunlight in. And so we are grateful um, to Netflix because I think it made a big difference, the broad audience. It broadened the conversation and I think made it more objective and gave these young women more um, confidence in their, in their opinion, you know, in, in, in their own experience. So 
Anyway, thank you. I'm always very interested to hear from people who study this. Um, and I continue to learn more about it every day and kind of what enables. Um, so your insight is very much appreciated as well. I was, uh, I was extremely excited, but I was also very nervous for today's conversation because I mean, this kind of idea of actually trying to listen to what these experiences of, of all the gymnasts and athletes in general that are coming forward in sport, because I think my biggest takeaway is that this is something that's still ongoing. The documentary kind of seemed like a, a starting point, really. It was like the start of the domino effect. So I think yeah, that's one of the biggest takeaways. Line. We are not, we're just right at the very beginning. I think it has drawn a new start line, which is, okay, now more people see that this is a problem. Like I've been just yelling from the rooftops for, you know, 12, 15 years, like this is a problem. And everyone was like, shut up. <laughs> so now, um, shut up you're crazy and now it's like okay there's a good number of people athletes insiders credible people who are standing here and saying this is the problem we haven't even started the fix thing yet you know we're just at the point where everybody's not everybody half the people i will say are willing to kind of consider that this is a problem so we start from here completely agreed um if you want to learn anything more about what jennifer say's work is about then go ahead and check up uh, chalked up your life in gymnastics and elite gymnastics and also athlete a is on netflix so uh that's available if you have a netflix subscription as well there's a i'm not trying to hawk my book here but i think it has a different level of insight i, I wrote a new introduction that that's only available digitally like an ebook form and it sort of bridges the gap between when the book came out and now and kind of everything I went through in terms of the backlash. So, and everything I learned and continue to learn about the culture and why it persists. So it offers a little bit more insight even, I think, than the, than, you know, the original, if anyone's interested. I'm very interested in that. I think the backlash part is very important for people to understand because what you inevitably hear is if this was happening to you, why didn't you speak up? And right. I, Every time I hear that, it makes my blood boil. Because if you've ever been an abuse victim, number one, you have no vocabulary to speak up, no experience, no adult in your world tells you what it is, how to protect yourself or how to narrate it. And then on top of that, the second you speak up, you start to suffer more than the, the abuse. You get okay. re-victimized in terrible ways. So the I would argue the digital introduction is the start of your second book. And then I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. And that is exactly what I talk about, all the reasons that you don't and how my confidence and courage built the more people pushed and how it was a way for me to say the story is true. I'm not accepting any other versions from all of the from the peanut gallery. Right. So what you what you have done is created for so many people, hundreds and hundreds of people and ultimately victims and people that will read your work and see that film. You've created a community of pride not a community of shame. And I think that's just, that's a true legacy. You should just be very proud of yourself. Thank you. That is a lovely sentiment. <laughs> yep. I'm, I'm listening and I'm also grateful that we have people listening um, back, back home as well. So thank you to everyone that's been listening so far for today's episode. And, and uh, there's more to come in the following week from Mindset Lab. Thank you. Uh -huh.